Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. prayer of approach. Let us pray together. Holy God, we come to worship in the gathering shadows of Jesus' suffering and death. We come with his friends, the men and women who have followed him in every place and generation, to live once again this story of service and betrayal, of weakness and of courage. We come to witness your love in action. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.
prayer for illumination. We pray as the psalmist sings, Lord, in your light we see light. And to that end, may you illumine our minds and inspire our hearts to respond to your living word this day. Amen. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. The first reading this morning is from Matthew 27 on the suicide of Jesus. Judas. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they replied, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price. And they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. What follows is an interpretive commentary from the perspective of Judas. It started with borrowing a few coins now and then from the common purse. Nothing big, and besides, I deserved a little something for my work as treasurer. Before long, I was helping myself to a bigger share. I needed the money, and nobody seemed to miss it. And then came my big opportunity, a one-time payoff to assist in a secret arrest. They'll eventually get Jesus anyway, with or without my help, so I might as well be the one to cash in on it. What started with pinching a few coins here and there has led to me being an accessory to murder. And the victim is a man who treated me with nothing but kindness for three years, a person who called me friend even as I betrayed him. The money I thought I love disgusts me now. I tried to give it back, but the men who paid me couldn't care less. I wish I could undo what I've done, but it's too late. What I've done sickens me. I threw the money down, and now I'm going to do the only thing I can think of.
A reading from Mark, chapter 15, verses 21 to 22. Simon of Cyrene's story. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. Simon's commentary. My pilgrimage was almost over. I traveled all the way from Cyrene in Libya for the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. I was coming up the road on my way into the city when I met the huge crowd of people all staring at something or someone. Three men carrying stout wooden cross beams were being nudged along at sword point, headed for crucifixion. One looked like he had been dead already, his back bloody, his feet, face beaten to a pulp, his eyes swollen nearly shut. Some sadist had even jammed a wreath of thorns into his scalp. It was awful. But what could I do for him? I began to move on. A rough hand grabbed my shoulder. I turned to see the bloody prisoner pinned under the heavy beam. He couldn't carry it another step. The soldiers were telling me to help them. Of all the people here, why me? I'd just made that long, long trip in from Cyrene, and now I was supposed to lug across uphill for an exhausted criminal? As it turns out, my life would never be the same. The troublesome task forced on me became the greatest privilege any man could ever have because the bloody stranger whose cross I carried was the Son of God, my living Lord. My sons, Alexander and Rufus, were with me that day. They too became followers of Jesus. We know, better than most, that anyone who does not carry his cross and follow Jesus cannot be his disciple.
John 19, 19 to 24. The soldier's story. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. Commentary of the Soldier You get used to it after a while. The first crucifixion is always the hardest. The naked flesh, the oozing blood, the buzzing flies, the first shrieks of pain, followed by hours of gasping suffocation. The first time you see it, it turns your stomach. But after a while, you can handle it. If you're lucky, you might even get a little something for yourself. Most of the time, you don't know the people you're crucifying. You're a soldier, and your job is to do what you are told. But this is different. It's hard to resist having a little fun with a fellow labeled King of the Jews. Before you nail him up, give him a stick for a scepter, a crown made of thorns. Rough him up a bit, then da bow down to the king way more entertaining than your average crucifixion. Today, there's something for everybody. All four soldiers get a piece of clothing they can sell at a local pawn shop. But what about that seamless tunic? It would be a shame to cut it up. Hey, how about a game to pass the time. Calvary Casino, winner gets the tunic. See? It's not so hard to do this. After a while, nothing shocks you anymore.
John 16, John 19, verses 25 to 27, Mary's story. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that, that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Mary's commentary. When my son was just a baby, being presented at the temple, old Simeon said, a sword will pierce your own soul too. That prophecy is echoed often in my ears. At the time, I had no idea what those words could mean. Now I know. My firstborn is nailed to a cross. This grief, it's beyond imagining. John is beside me, weighed down by his own sorrow. He left everything to follow Jesus, awed by his miracles, transfixed by his teaching. Over the years, he became a close friend to my son. And now this friend, beyond all friends, is dying. John and I stand together near the cross, our world in ruins. Then we hear the voice we both love speaking to us. Through my tears, I look into the tender eyes of my son. Dear woman, here is your son. I turn my head and John's eyes meet mine. Here is your mother, Jesus says. I am not alone, and neither is John. Together, we will get through this.
Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43, the dying thief's story. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief's commentary. My life was a waste a complete disaster. The world would have been better off without me. In the end, it did get rid of me. My crimes and cruelty got me here, and I deserve this death. At first, I cursed the guy hanging next to me, right along with the other criminal. But then I got to thinking, if God is real, before long, I'll be facing him. I knew I was on the cross because I deserved it. But Jesus was totally innocent. It struck me then that maybe, just maybe, this wouldn't be the end of Jesus. I'm not sure where that idea came from, but I became more and more convinced of it. So I said it, Jesus, remember me? In heaven, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more hatred, no more guilt, only joy, peace, delight, and acceptance. Jesus will be there too radiant beyond description, and I will be with him forever.
Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 39, the centurion's story, the death of Jesus. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. Commentary of the centurion. I shed tears every time I told this story to Mark years after my Lord's crucifixion. I was three years away from finishing my 20 years service to the Legion. I was so close to my pension, I could taste the bread and the grapes that I'd be growing and harvesting on the hillside of my family land in Antium. As I remember, I had participated in many crucifixions before that day outside the walls of Jerusalem. I'm now 55, and I can say that Jesus was afraid, but then again, who wouldn't be? I've been so afraid of going into battle with my legion that I could barely stand or breathe or contain myself. The crucifixion of Jesus was just another day until the unbelievable begins to happen around me. A storm coming across the hills from the Aegean reaches us in the afternoon, but this is not unusual. What is unusual is that this storm was not a storm of wind and rain, but of gloom that glowers upon Calvary so much so, the hairs on the back of my neck and my arms stood up. Why did I say aloud those words, truly this man was God's son? I didn't know much about the Hebrew God, but what I did know was that Jesus went to the cross willingly and that made him either a fool or a madman. In those moments of his death, he demonstrated great love and trust in God's goodness and justice. He asked God to forgive me and the two thieves on either side of him. And only then did he say, it is finished. Did I know this was the incarnate Son of God? Not at that moment, no. But what I did know was that I was going to follow this man's teaching. In following, I came to know that Jesus was incarnate and God's only Son and my Savior.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Jesus' death, is there anything we need to know? The why did Jesus do it is fairly straightforward. From the very beginning of time, something innocent always paid the cost of someone's guilt and wrongdoing. But how does the work of the cross and the death of Jesus do this for our benefit? Through the transference of sin from that which is unholy to something or someone innocent or clean. In order to understand the cross, you have to look back into the age of the temple, the first temple. And more specifically, the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16, verses 7 to 10. I'm going to read this for you, and I I need you to really listen to this. This is the commandment, the description of the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. He shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and offer it as a purification offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness of Azazel. So on the Day of Atonement, from the very beginning with Aaron on up, one goat was brought uh, along with another. And it says that one would be chosen by lot to be the sacrifice. And the other would be chosen to be the goat that bears the sin. So one goat went to the altar, but the other goat was the goat in which the high priest would come over it and he would put his hand on the head of the goat and he would pray that the sin of the people would be taken away from them and placed onto this goat. And that goat then would be taken brought out into what they call was the wilderness of Azazel. The wilderness of Azazel Azazel is the wilderness of the demons, the wilderness of the damned. That's what Azazel means in, in Hebrew. In other words, it's hell. Jesus, like the scapegoat, dies in the only place where sin and evil remain outside of God's memory and care. Here, the sin of the world is remembered no more. The Lord goes out to the desert of Azazel. I think the Apostles' Creed puts it in this way in their time and period of trying to understand what was happening. The Creed says, he descended into hell. Maybe it makes more sense now. The Scriptures explain that Christ became the sin-bearer of the world so that in his body, all the penalty for sin would be laid upon him because that was the will of the Father. This isn't a transactional thing for us in the sense that the Son of God was going to do this 
whether we needed him or wanted him to do it anyway. This was the Lamb of God who was sacrificed, crucified before the world began. Jesus went to this place to make final atonement for our sin. This place, this wilderness of, of Azazel, this hell wasn't made for us. As one of the, the creeds would say, it was made for the devil and his angels. But what it did do was this. Jesus, as the sin bearer, takes the world's sin and he lays it down in that place of hell and leaves it there. Never to be remembered again by God. That's the love that God has for us. Rather than God saying, you're terrible people and I'm going to visit my wrath upon you. God says, that was never my intention to turn my wrath upon you. I love you. I'm going to turn my wrath upon me. And the son is going to be the bearer of that wrath. And this is a fundamental Christian teaching. God didn't love us because he had to. Or that he resents having to send his son. That somehow God won't love us if we can't wrap our minds around his love for us. But when Jesus died in this atonement, this covering over, there is nothing left for us to say, where is my God or how do I know God? Jesus always said that when the kingdom would come, it would be near you. It would be in your mouth and it would be on your lips. It would be there, meaning he would be there with us. I'm going to read one scripture from 2 Corinthians 5. And I want you to read it now in light of what you know I have said. This is what the scripture says. This is what Paul says to the church in Corinth. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let that sink in for a minute. Just let that sink in for a minute. The ministry of reconciliation, that's what the cross is all about, that we might be reconciled to God. And, and how is this possible? Because Jesus, as the sin bearer, took the sin of the world and laid it in the one place in the universe 
that nothing is ever remembered by him. And of course, we know the rest of the story on Easter. Why is this? Why can we trust this? Because on the third day, he ascended from hell. He ascended from the area of the dead. But that's a story for Sunday. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As awful and terrible as the cross was, the love of God was poured forth so that we might have a Savior who went down to the depths of hell and came back from it. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, there are very few words to express the sadness and the sorrow of our Savior's death. It's hard for us to understand how love could overcome such evil, such brokenness in our world. And yet, in Christ's resurrection, there is power so that we might too be witnesses and ambassadors to a ministry of reconciliation to the world. Lord, we thank you that Jesus did not die in vain. His death was not just an example or a story but it was truly a death that changed the world. May you, O oh Lord, bless us in this hour. We pray that you would comfort those who are overwhelmed, for those who are sick and aged and those who are dying. We pray especially for Ralph Murray's son today. We pray for all of those in need of care. Lord, may you dismiss us now. Dismiss us with your blessing. Even if today the blessing wounds. In his name, even Jesus our Lord's. Amen.